sorry, dialogue box. Uh, first, I wanna offer some heartfelt thanks. On behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences Dean's Office, I want to thank all the support that we've been given to run this event. I want to thank President Sue Henderson and Provost Tamara Joshi for their support of this important effort and the encouragement that they've offered. I would also like to thank the President's Administrative Council for promoting and supporting this town hall concept. As you might expect, there have been many moving parts to put this together, so I would be remiss if I didn't call some folks out to offer my appreciation. Jason Kroll, Ira Thor, Gary Gordon, Dr. Joao Sedisius, and Dr. Erin O'Neill, my colleagues here at NJCU, who've offered their insights, assistance, and always being there to help us out, even in the wee hours. Finally, I wanna give a big shout out to all of our panelists. When I reached out to each of the experts that you're about to hear from today, and asked if they would consider joining this panel, there wasn't even a hint of hesitation. They were eager to jump in and be part of an effort to help the folks in our community better understand the issues in science around the COVID-19 vaccine and ultimately give us the best chance to march our way out of this pandemic. Before I turn this town hall over to President Henderson for her opening remarks, I wanna share two reasons why I feel privileged to be here. For me, this is personal. I very well understand the tenor of some of the, con uh, some of the discussions that are going on among folks in our community and in people's homes with respect to the COVID vaccine. In my own family, I have relatives who have no interest in getting vaccinated. For example, in my last conversation with a cousin, he believed that he had COVID late last year. Why? singularly and for no other reason because he had a really bad cold. He continued that he was now likely immune and thus it would be completely pointless to get vaccinated. And yet the same family, my family, has suffered with COVID head on. We have lost beloved family members, most recently having lost my aunt only a couple of months ago. COVID has brought a lot of sadness and reflection about what could have been different and what we could have done differently. The second reason I'm happy to be here is that for the first time after the pandemic has entered and changed our lives, I feel some genuine optimism about the future. Why? Because we have actually, we actually have a highly effective intervention that can dramatically lower person's likelihood of serious infection and disease. Today in the United States, we have reached a point where millions of people have been vaccinated and vaccinations are continuing at a spectacular clip. We've made a lot of progress, but we have more to do. It is in our collective interest to have everyone better understand the facts behind the vaccination effort so that people can operate from a position of knowledge about getting vaccinated. With the availability of vaccine weaponry, getting that jab will hopefully move us forward to the point that this virus and pandemic become a distant memory. And on that optimistic note, I would like to introduce the leader of our fine university, our president, Dr. Sue Henderson. Thank you, Scott, and thank you all so much for coming today and for the work that these speakers are going to do. It's really important. Um, I want to welcome you today to this important COVID-19 vaccine question and answer town hall. Today's event is an important educational opportunity to answer any questions that you might be wondering about when it comes to vaccinations. There is so much misinformation out there that spreads online and through social media about vaccines. And today, you'll be able to learn the truth from a panel of eight experts who will give you facts and answer your questions that might be lingering in your mind. Here's a fact. Vaccines work by preparing your immune system in the event of an infection without causing an actual infection. It's insurance for your immune system. The good news is that vaccinations are continuing to trend upward. Here in Hudson County, we had a record new milestone yesterday with 51% of adult residents now having received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Statewide, 
Uh, more than 7.2 million vaccine doses have been administered and more than 3.3 million New Jerseyans are now fully vaccinated. And that's out of a state with about 9 million people. Nationally, according to the CDC, as of Monday, more than 246 million vaccine doses have been administered across the United States. More than 56% of the adult population has received at least one dose, and 40% of those adults have gotten two doses. Last month, NJCU became the second four-year institution in the state to announce that students taking in-person classes in the fall will be required to show proof of immunization. Since then, the number has increased to 11 institutions. Why were we among the first to make this announcement? Well, it's because NJCU has highest priority is the safe return to a vibrant in-person learning environment. We are committed to ensuring that our faculty and students are safe when they return to in-person classes and that every member of our NJCU community who needs a vaccination can receive one prior uh, through a priority access appointments for our community. This step will enrich the college experience in fall of 2021 as we expand our in-person activities. As we've been reminded this past year, we must come together as a nation and as a community to finally end the COVID-19 pandemic. Too many of us have experienced the impact of this pandemic firsthand. Getting vaccinated is the best way for us to do that right now. On Tuesday, President Biden announced a new goal to administer at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccines to 70% of the American adults by the 4th of July. The U.S. also aims to have 160 million adults fully vaccinated by then. President Biden's initial goal of 100 million doses in his first 100 days has been so successful, the nation doubled that goal. An ambitious plan indeed, but one that is proving to be helping our nation venture further down the road to recovery. Today, immediately following the conclusion of this event, if you have yet to be vaccinated but haven't been able to get an appointment or are still thinking about it, NJCU has partnered with the City of New Jersey and Hudson County for a walk-up vaccination event right here on campus. The Jersey City Mobile Unit will host a vaccination site today until 6 o'clock in the evening on Lot 4 on campus. This site is op also open to the public, so anyone watching this conversation today can come. No appointment is necessary and there is no cost. I particularly want to thank Mayor Stephen Fulop and his team in the Mayor's Office for their partnership on this important public health initiative. I particularly want to thank Scott, Dr. Scott Mittman, Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences for all of his hard work in organizing this crucial conversation and his leadership and guidance throughout the COVID pandemic. A special welcome today. I want to thank including to Dr. Miriam Bedowd, Dr. Gloria Bozeman, Dr. Anthony Espedito, and Dr. John Grew, full-time members of our faculty here at NJCU. I wanna welcome Stacy Flanagan, the Director of Department of Health and Human Services from the City of New Jersey, Welcome back to NJC to you, two former adjunct of faculties, Dr. Paras Asasi and Dr. Sanjay Kuhl. And I'm so pleased to have one of our graduating seniors, Louis Perez, moderating today's event. Louis will graduate on June 3rd, 15th in our in-person ceremony at the Prudential Center with a, a Bachelor of Science in Public Health Education. We are so excited to be able to celebrate the classes of 20 and 21 in person, a much more traditional format. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Henderson. Appreciate those words. Let's uh, move into a, uh, our next phase. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, is that visible for everybody? <laughs> uh, I want to welcome everybody to the COVID-19 vaccine town hall. Uh, I, I want to make sure all the attendees, if you have a question at any time throughout this town hall, please use the Q&A uh, button on the Zoom screen, and we will try to get to all the questions in the time that we have allotted. Uh, I want to uh, open up with a very short uh, six slide presentation not to uh, uh, turn anybody off, but we want to just be able to orient uh, today's conversation and make sure that we center in on some points. Uh, everybody knows the virus that we're talking about, COVID-19, uh, but just to be sure, uh, we want to make very, very clear that COVID-19 is responsible for many multi-organ, multi-system uh, disease caused by the coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2. 
Uh, I'm not a big fan of reading all the words on slides. I'm a big fan of just presenting. But one of the things I wanted to point out here is the image. It's an image that probably everybody is familiar with. This is a representation of a single coronavirus virion. The squiggly thing inside is, uh, is the, uh, uh, the uh, genetic material. That's the information that's needed that the vaccine needs, surrounded by a capsid and an envelope that contains spike protein. You've probably all heard about that. That's the central uh, focus for our vaccine therapy and technologies. Um, moving forward to the vaccines, we wanted to make a, a point very clear to everybody that none of the COVID-19 vaccines currently used in the US are produced from live COVID-19 virus. We wanted to make sure everybody got that key point. This particular slide is focusing on the mRNA um, vaccine made by Pfizer and Moderna, and they consist of these viral genes that are encased in uh, uh, fat. On the left side, left image, you have the coronavirus virion. On the right side, that is the vaccine. And all it contains is a small piece of genetic material, the instructions for a part of the spike protein. That's it. Moving on to the next slide, this one will focus on the DNA-based um, uh, uh, vaccines. And again, none of these vaccines currently used in the US are produced from a live virus. Uh, as you can see, the image on the left is the virus. The image on the right um, is the uh, representation of the vaccine inside a harmless virus, a virus that does not replicate. And again, it only contains the instructions for a portion of the spike protein. And we're down to the last two slides. Hope we haven't lost you yet. But some of the major points, and the president mentioned this a moment ago, very important to recognize that vaccination prepares your immune system for a possible infection without causing an infection. Uh, one of the uh, oft mentioned concerns is that the RNA vaccine technology is not new. It's been in use since the 1990s. And this is one of the reasons why the vaccine was able to be developed so quickly. RNA degrades extremely quickly after it's injected. So that's the reason why you need two injections with the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines in order to stimulate the best possible immunity. As everyone is well aware of these days, COVID-19 vaccines present SARS, hospitalizations, use of ventilators, organ damage and death. Also something not mentioned here is also prevents the long haul COVID symptoms that a lot of people seem to be suffering with. Finally, to reemphasize COVID-19 vaccines contain RNA and they cannot destroy, they don't interact, they don't uh, get involved or change your genes in any way. COVID-19 vaccines are intended to trigger an inflammatory response and it is normal for many people to experience pain at the injection site, sometimes fever, fatigue, discomfort for one or two days after the vaccination. I'd like to move on to the next part of our, uh, of our town hall and get you some information about you know, vaccination efforts locally and how vaccination is progressing in our local area. So I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Director Stacy Flanagan, the uh, Director of the Health and Human Services here in Jersey City. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Mittman. Um, it's a privilege to be here. And um, just we're lucky enough to have um, Luis Perez uh, actually share with us um, some time. And he is moderating the questions when you're done. Uh, and he's a former student. So it's exciting for me to see how he's grown in his career in, in health. And these are just important topics. I'm going to share my screen with you all right now, and uh, I'm going to share with you some local uh, Jersey City efforts around vaccines. Um, as you may or may not know, um, as early as uh, September, October, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services started planning with our local federally qualified health centers and the State Department of Health 
on vaccine uh, planning and where we were going to go from here. We have two hospitals local in Jersey City, plus three federally qualified health centers. In addition to that, we have nearly 50 pharmacies, um, all having the opportunity to share vaccines. Uh, in addition to that, some large medical groups had bid for vaccine uh, integration with their medical facility, i.e. the Jersey City Medical Center, Barnabas, or CarePoint Christ Hospital. So through all of those partners put together um, here on our Jersey City Tableau related to vaccines, um, I'm sharing that across Jersey City, those residents who have a zip code in Jersey City we have um, put 159,000 shots in arms. Uh, what does that mean? That means um, about 100,000, uh, 100,763 uh, have received at least one dose of Moderna or Pfizer. 51,317 have received their second dose of Moderna and Pfizer. And 6,935 have received just a one dose uh, Johnson & Johnson shot. So this puts us as a city somewhere close to 30% uh, of um, completely vaccinated and slightly lower of uh, just one dose of vaccines. We also thought it was very important for us to really look at um, how we were doing as far as targeting populations who had been impacted by COVID. Now, what you see here is all the data collected across the medical institutions, not just the Jersey City directed sites. So um, we identified race uh, is the red line and against the race of the population percentage. So we were able to uh, provide 29% um, of our doses went to Asian, uh, but 22% of the Jersey City population identifies as Asian. Uh, so forth, uh, Black or African American, 10%, whereas 19% identify as uh, Black or African American, 17%. Uh, Hispanic or Latino, whereas 22% identify as um, Hispanic or Latino. Uh, here where we see a large gap of other and or missing or unknown data at the state level. So this is all data that's gone to the state. So there is a little bit of mismatch here of what we know and what we don't know versus the white population where we have vaccinated 24% of people who identify as white versus those uh, at large in the population. Uh, with our specific municipal efforts, and that means that the same effort that's on campus today at the mobile unit, we try to ensure that we got greater data. Um, we wouldn't really, um, you know, uh, allow someone to go through unless they shared with us that they do not want to identify. Um, and through this, we update this every few days because uh, it takes a little bit of time to get all of the data up and into the state system. Um, to date, we have 47,993 shots in arms. That's as of May 1st. Um, through that, we've identified the age brackets of those individuals who have been vaccinated. And you could see here nearly 30% of all vaccines that we've provided in the city of Jersey City through municipal efforts had gone to seniors. And you may have heard that was a real priority for us in the beginning of COVID. Uh, and then you, you can see here, um, and I'll like open this up just a little bit, uh, zip code related, we've identified zip codes where we saw a large number of people with COVID, and those are the zip codes that we wanted to focus on primarily in the beginning of our vaccine efforts. And those were 07305, um, who has the highest number of COVID cases in our city, but also the highest number of vaccines because we really targeted um, this, this neighborhood to really ensure that we got health equity here. Uh, then 07, 306 and 07304. And we're working through the other is those who live 
uh, who work um, for the city of Jersey City and live elsewhere or are educated like many of you on this Zoom who you do not need to live in Jersey City to get a vaccine here. Um, we just say live, work or are educated here. Uh, and then our races come up um, almost about the same. We are identifying a little bit less in um, Asian uh, individuals and a little bit higher in Black or African American, uh, but other still mixed, unknown, or um, you know, chose not to identify. So that's just um, you know, feet on the ground. What we're doing locally, and I will um, give this back to Dr. Mitman. Well, oh, thank you very much, uh, Director Flanagan. Uh, very good information. Okay, we're moving over into the Q and A uh, portion of the town hall, and I'd like to introduce Mr. Luis Perez. He is a our moderator. And uh, Luis, can you take it away? Thank you very much, Scott. I just want to again thank everyone for joining us here today, and give my appreciation to Scott Mittman for putting all of us here together. We have such a great uh, diverse cast of panelists here, ranging from biologists, public health experts, uh, nurses, uh, and at least seven doctors. So we have a good amount of information on various topics. Um, earlier, while registering for this event, we put out a survey and we received over 15 questions. Uh, we have about 40 minutes left in our time slot and we want to try to address every single one of these questions that were pre-submitted, but we will also attempt to answer every question submitted live right now through the Q&A chat. There may be some questions that are moderately similar, um, but if you think something isn't explained well enough, you could also ask that in the chat or in the question section as well, if you want a little bit more clarification on a topic. Uh, to start, I think it's important to talk about what is the vaccine, because a lot of people mentioned being unsure about how effective the vaccine actually is. And since most of the vaccines have two, two doses, how long after the first or the second dose do you have to wait to get the full benefits of being vaccinated? Um, I'll open this to the floor. Um, I can take that if you want, and um, I will, if it's all right uh, with everyone, uh, share what I think is a very important um, bit of information from, from my computer. Um, so <clears throat> the guidelines are that uh, the full immunity, the full benefit of the vaccine requires about uh, two weeks after the, after the second shot. Um, that's the time in which um, the immune system um, takes to reach its, its fullest uh, uh, strength. So, um, and I wanna also show um, this uh, image, this slide, which I believe is, is, is very important. This is, uh, um, was prepared from a, a large uh, clinical trial of over 30,000 people in evaluating the um, effectiveness of the Moderna vaccine. And you can see that the, um, the efficiency rates are, are very high and um, they're, they're also fairly comparable across different uh, demographic categories, for instance, age and sex and, and ethnicity. And so there has been some concern <clears throat> that uh, the vaccines may um, not be as effective in certain groups of people, but uh, the, the data uh, belies that fact and that the vaccine is, is highly effective, roughly 95% effective. And what that means is that compared to unvaccinated individuals, 95 out of 100 persons will be protected from the most significant effects of COVID infection, meaning acute respiratory distress syndrome, difficulty breathing, difficulty oxygenating tissues, including vital organs that can suffer from low oxygenation, being put on a ventilator, being hospitalized, and um, possibly dying. And also the post-COVID uh, symptoms that we're starting to see in some people, many of which are neurological symptoms, 
difficulty focusing, difficulty converging uh, one's eyes, <clears throat> difficulty in, um, in, in, in recalling memories and concentration, and also um, sleep and fatigue uh, symptoms, which are troubling people many months after infection. Uh, the, the immunity after infection is thought to be about 85%, meaning <clears throat> compared to an uninfected group, an unrecovered group of, pe of 100 people, 85, of pe 85 people out of every 100 who recovered from COVID will not get it again. However, that leaves um, a, a much higher susceptibility among the people who have recovered in being reinfected and possibly rehospitalized and, and suffering all of these other consequences. I hope that that helps to um, explain some of the um, issues associated with that question and then let's move on. Thank you for that reply, uh, Dr. John Grew. Um, Miriam, I believe you may have some more insight on the differences between getting immunity from the vaccine versus getting immunity from post-exposure. Yes, thank you, Louis. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm actually really happy to be here and uh, to be able to interact with the faculty, students, staff. And I know many of you have many, many questions. But um, this particular question is interesting. A lot of people are saying, well, maybe I don't need the vaccine if I um, actually get the disease. Maybe I'd rather wait until and get the disease. There's less risk to get that. So what's the difference between getting the disease and actually um, getting the vaccine? Well, in both cases, you feel like there is symptoms. The, in, in any case where you're sick, you actually have a lot of the symptoms come actually from your body responding to the virus or to the bacteria. Your body is just increasing body temperature, you feel uh, shivering, but that's your body fighting. It's not the bacteria or the virus itself. So when you get the vaccine, you might have a little reaction, one day, two days, uh, a, a worst reaction, but both of which are just saying, my body's working, my body's doing great. Um, and I'm happy actually when I, when I, when I, had, I had my second dose and I was waiting for the effect because I felt bad if, if my, 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 my husband got a bad effect. I was like, oh, lucky him, his body reacted well and he's gonna have a lot of antibody. When I was waiting to get more, I didn't get as much. But anyway, so that's the principle. Now, getting the disease is different. You will, yes, many people have heard, you will get immunity, but that immunity might not be as strong as the one you get with the two doses of the vaccine. First of all, it depends on how much your body will recognize it. It's not as strong. And the other problem is if you get the disease, well, you will have damages to your body because the disease means the virus enters your cells, not only your lung cell, your kidneys, your brain. It might affect many tissue in your body. And unfortunately, those damage might not be actually repaired and you will have long-term damage. Whereas the vaccine, it's a short-term and the effect is not lasting. And that's a big difference. So to be honest, when I had the choice between getting the disease and taking the vaccine, I couldn't wait to get the vaccine. That's a short term, that's not a long term. And I've seen the long term effect. So yes, the immunity you will get from the vaccine is longer, better from what we know at this point. And it's the effect that you have on the vaccine are actually not as strong and not as bad, as, of course, as uh, the disease itself and not long lasting. So thank you. One point I would like to add is that that response from getting the vaccine, that's all your own body. That is you. It's got nothing to do with the vaccine itself. It's your body's response to it. And then it ends. I, I had side effects, had a little fever, and then poof, it was gone. And now I feel much more optimistic at taking on the day. Lou, you want to move to the next question? Of course. Um, I think in part of that, it's important to highlight that getting vaccinated isn't only a decision that you should make for yourself. And I think Dr. Gloria Bozeman has some insight to the other things we should consider when debating on should we or should we not get vaccinated. 
one moment. Thank you, <laughs> Lewis. I just wanted to, I was sitting here and I said, well, I'm not going to jump over people because that's my usual mode. It's like, oh, let me dive in. <laughs> but I wanted to just say thank you. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to participate. Uh, with the panel, and certainly there are a lot of distinguished and um, personnel on the panel, and I always love the opportunity to dialogue with colleagues and certainly address those who are in the larger audience. Uh, in listening to Dr. Gu and his um, uh, certainly important information that uh, pervades our community with regard to the communities of color and certainly that information related to the specifics about our concerns about the uh, efficacy of the, uh, the vaccine that was reaching our community. Uh, the issues go a little further than just whether or not the vaccine that we were receiving in the community would be effective in the community. I think the bottom line is the issue of trust in the community and whether or not we can trust a system that unfortunately has not always uh, has not always demonstrated that we could trust it. So the issue becomes for our community, can we trust the system? Can we trust the science? And the reality is that there is a valid suspiciousness. But in this particular situation, I think that the community has to realize that we are going to have to accept some responsibility in this to really do our own investigation with regard to the science, which is what I did with regard to the science. That in these clinical trials, we were represented. In other instances, we can't always say that. But as I began to look at who were in the clinical trials and where were the clinical trials conducted, uh, it was a fortunate situation that in these clinical trials, the medical schools that I am familiar with, Mahari, Howard University, Morehouse School of Medicine, they were also the sites where clinical trials were conducted. So I had this assurance that people of color were in those clinical trials. Women were in those clinical trials because that's an important configuration as well. And so I had some confidence that we were in that representative pool that were a part of the clinical trials. Uh, we had the opportunity to participate by uh, even in, in, in adding our names to the representation that went out in the general population if you wanted to participate in a clinical trial. And that had never happened before. And I think what Dr. Merriam brought up as well is that we looked at it and had this opportunity to see the devastation in our community. And having seen that disproportionate representation with regard to the impact in my community, I felt a personal obligation to say, listen, if this is something that I can assume a personal responsibility in and taking, taking the measures to protect myself first and my community second, then I had an obligation to be immunized. I was in the first, when we talk about vaccine hesitancy, I was in the first group with regard to giving an immunization. Yes, young people, you may not experience the same devastation in terms of the impact of what we were seeing in terms of death. But the reality was that if you got the disease, passed it on to other communities, we would. And so you have an obligation you have that responsibility to protect not only yourself, but your community. This time, we can, we can accept that responsibility to protect not only an individual or personal responsibility, but a community responsibility. Thank you very much for that very important insight to the many diverse communities that exist, especially here in Jersey City. We are an extremely diverse city we have people from all walks of life. We have people that come in from out of state from multiple countries to visit our university. Uh, and besides people of different locations, there's also the age component. Um, I believe Dr. Parisa Asasi, you have some insight for even after getting a vaccination, what is the importance of still wearing a mask? <laughs> I always I make a mistake. 
I would uh, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, NJCU for inviting me and all the students who are joining us and sharing their ideas, thoughts regarding their um, uh, vaccine. Uh, I would say we need to um, uh, uh, put mask because um, as we know, we want to protect ourselves and also we want to protect our community and to help to end pandemic. The reason we need to have a mask uh, is because uh, if we want to go to uh, science, uh, uh, the uh, COVID-19 vaccine is designed to basically to reduce the symptoms and also reduce the severity of disease and prevent that. So there is a chance for a person who fully vaccinated to be infected, but since the person has um, already had vaccine, the symptoms might be very mild or no symptom. So that uh, there is a chance to transmit to disease to the other person. So, and we don't know the other people in the room or even in our community are fully vaccinated or not. So we need to put the mask to protect other people uh, from getting the disease and uh, also uh, to end the pandemic. The good news is now we are learning more how these vaccines are uh, working in terms of the transmission. And uh, when we have more data, we might see more relaxed rules from CDC or other organization. And uh, it will make our life a little bit more easy. And we might be able to take our masks and hug our uh, 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 loved ones. So for me, I didn't see my mother for almost 14 months, and I, um, I, I'm i just uh, looking, um, uh, I, I would like my mom to get her second dose of vaccine, and I would be able to go and see her. I fully vaccinated, so that's a good news, that's a hope for me, and I'm just looking for that minute to see my mom after almost 15 months. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's an important point. I know for myself, I had to avoid seeing my mother for a good amount of time. I remember when we first went into lockdown, I was petrified at the idea of, since I commute and I'm on public transit a lot, that I would go to my mom's to do laundry and then I'd go home and find out that she got infected. Um, but it's good to know that that's not just our concerns, but even the doctors themselves are thinking about this as well. Um, I think you did answer very well on spread, but I think Miriam has a point to add. Um, yes, I would like to follow up on uh, uh, Dr. Asasi about the, the wearing a mask. And I, I've, I've heard a lot of people saying, okay, you make me take the, vi the, the vaccine. Now I can take off the mask. Why do I have to wear it? Now, like Dr. Asasi said, you're gonna still, there is still a virus passing from one person to another. Now it's not gonna get you sick. There is another major, major, major problem is uh, every time the virus is moving from one individual to another, they're getting a chance to start learning how we're fighting them and what they do, they change, they switch. That's something that all microorganisms do. Viruses, bacteria do that. This is what you all know as antibiotic resistance. That's what you all know as changing changes induce virus. And this is why we have new strains of viruses. So trying to keep as much as possible this distance, even if you get vaccinated, trying to keep this good habit could avoid more transmission, therefore less chances that we will get more variant. As you know, we already have some variant and we don't know how we're gonna, how those variants are gonna be uh, taken care of. So just to emphasize, it's important as much as we can to try to keep uh, all our precaution to avoid any new variant to be up. Thank you. Oh, I'd like to add to that. There, there are actually some more sides uh, to, to discover there. Uh, so Dr. Bendow is exactly right. There's the concern about variants and the, the variable, you know, maybe ability of the vaccines to deal with those variants. But the other thing is, particularly when you're indoors, do you know that everybody in that room has been vaccinated? Some people maybe say that they have, but you can't be certain. There's another side to it, and that is, 
the data is still somewhat inconclusive about whether a vaccinated person, maybe they can fight off uh, disease and effect, infection themselves, but can they still carry it when they're visiting their aunt or their grandmother or someone who's immune compromised and can't get vaccinated? That's an important consequence. And while the data does seem to show that the J&J &J and AstraZeneca do seem to be relatively effective at uh, uh, preventing transmission, we don't know that so clearly about the Pfizer and Moderna. And so it's just a safety precaution that we're not only looking out for ourselves, but we're looking out for others. If this is a respect for other people as much as you worry about yourself. I think that's an important point to make. Yeah. And, and, I, and I would just jump in there just to, to kind of connect what Lewis mentioned and you um, all that we, I see the contact tracing for every case in the city of Jersey City and many of those cases um, are not born here. Uh, many individuals are going back to visit their family or going to family functions or going out outside of this community and something we feel pretty strongly about. It's about the footprint and how far you are from your home and to really make sure that you're keeping yourself aware and conscious of like who is around you. Can I, can I just add, <laughs> of course. Could I just Dr. add Broken. something? I'm sorry, somebody was speaking. Could I just add something? Mm -hmm. Also, in, in communities of color, in our community, we're already compromised in that we already experience a great deal of what we would call comorbidities. And that uh, we've got a lot of, we've got a lot of already diabetes, hypertension, uh, heart disease. So we find a lot of people in the community who are already sick. And that was another contributor to why we were disproportionately affected. So once again, when we begin to talk about protecting a community, we don't need another experience. And so it becomes important to get a holistic picture of what it is that we're dealing with here. And so it's not an isolated experience. And I need people to understand that, that basically we're talking about a holistic protection with regard to our community. And I, I don't even wanna begin with the misconceptions that are surrounding how you cure this disease, how you get this disease and how you transmit this disease. That would take another seminar. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to direct us towards uh, Dr. Sanjay Cowell. I believe you have some knowledge on how effective the vaccine is, like the day you take the shot versus if you wait a period of time. If I get the shot today, can I go out and actively talk with people or should I be more cautious and wait a certain amount of time? So uh, as the data shows right now that after the second dose, one has to wait for uh, no, uh, around two weeks, then you will have a full-fledged immunity in your body. Then you can do uh, no, whatever you want, but uh, after the second dose. But before that, you have to be cautious. Uh, uh, earlier points, I would like to add that even after vaccination, there's a possibility that there will be rare cases, which are called as the breakthrough cases. Sometimes what happens that uh, even though you have taken the vaccine, both the doses and some do uh, get uh, this infected. That can be because of three reasons. One is there's a possibility of imperfect vaccination, which is very rare. There's a possibility that individual's immune system is weak, which is not responding to the vaccines. And the third possibility is that the vaccine variants are there. It has been seen that unvaccinated people or such kind of people may be acting as the COVID variant incubators. And that's why we need to put the mask uh, to protect ourselves and to protect others in the larger interest of the community. Thank you. Um, a lot of people in hearing about the vaccine are a little bit confused on it being an mRNA vaccine. A lot of people haven't heard about an mRNA vaccine. And traditionally, lots of vaccines have been an inoculized version of a disease that is injected for things like or for most things besides 
this vaccine. Um, perhaps Dr. Mittman or Anthony Esposito may be able to speak more on the distinction of an mRNA vaccine versus a traditional one. Um, I, I can speak to that a bit. So, um, you know, I'm a, I've always been a cells and molecules guy. So ge genetics is, is my passion, as is virology. So I look at these things from this perspective and I understand, you know, the concern. And that's a very good question where you say, well, you know, you're injecting me with this genetic material. Is this like gene therapy? You know, is this going to harm me or anything? But, um, you know, and, and I could see the similarities, but it's also very different. Uh, and the big difference is permanence. So what happens with gene therapy and actually even some viruses do this like HIV is they will integrate into your genome permanently alter your genome and that will be passed on to other cells. These vaccines do not do that. So they're not integrating. They're just a, a small piece of mRNA or DNA that cannot integrate into your genome, doesn't touch your genome, um, can't replicate itself, and they're actually degraded very rapidly. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's not going to be permanent. You know, it's not going to be passed down or anything like that that you would expect. Um, from gene therapy, whereas viruses, um, you know, like the coronavirus, is actually injecting a very malicious, you know, mRNA into you, a positive strand RNA, and that actually can replicate, it can copy itself, um, it can spread to your other cells, and it codes information that is meant to destroy your cells, you know, at, at the and and copy itself is what it does. I, I think it's worthwhile to add. Just to be very clear, the, the mRNA component of the vaccine is for a very specific and small thing, now, only a portion of the spike protein so that your immune system can recognize and begin to mount a defense. So if they ever see that again, which would normally be present on the surface of a virus, you know, they're, they're completely ready. The other thing is, is that um, and it's the reason why with the Moderna and Pfizer, the mRNA uh, vaccines, that you have to get a second shot. It's because your cells, uh, they take away, they take apart that uh, messenger RNA very rapidly. About seven or eight minutes after the shot, there's nothing of that RNA left. It's gone. And so to be certain that your immune system has mounted an appropriate response, that's why we double down and you get a second shot. So just, just you know, be aware that and it never enters the nucleus. It never interacts with the, you know, your own DNA. And 10 minutes later, it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. Only your response to the, the shot. But the, the, uh, what's been injected no longer exists. Thank you. I think that clears up a lot of uh, misconceptions about how the mRNA interacts with the body. But it does seem like once you get the vaccine, it helps you prevent it. Does it help you if you were to have children? Let's say if a mother gets vaccinated, would that help her child at all or if her future offspring? Well, uh, you know, uh, one thing I could tell you is I, I read a couple of cases where uh, a pregnant woman got the shot and the baby was born. They tested the baby. The baby was born with antibodies um, against coronavirus. So that was certainly was a very promising, uh, uh, at least anecdotal uh, you know, piece of evidence there. But um, it looks like Dr. Gru wants to uh, step well, in. Well, I was going to say that if that's the case, those were the mother's antibodies. Uh, when we are born, uh, we have substantial quantities of certain types of antibodies that cross the placenta from the mother's bloodstream into us. And so when we are born, uh, this, this protects us for a certain period of time while we build up our own immunity to various things in the environment. And also um, mothers who nurse their babies would be giving antibodies that are present in milk. So if she has been uh, vaccinated recently vaccinated, then some of those antibodies would be against the coronavirus. And just to clarify, uh, these antibodies are not infectious. They're just the preventative antibodies that will stop further infection or possible contraction of coronavirus. These antibodies are very specific, right? They recognize very specific antigens 
that are you know represented on the surface of viruses. And that's also what the vaccine does, right? It primes the immune system to develop these antibodies that are specific. Um, some people may be confused with the words antigen and the makeup of the virus. Would it be fair to say that we can pretend that the virus is covered with plugs and our bodies notice that it's a European outlet and we do not want to attach that to our bodies or something similar to that effect? I love it. Uh, Miriam? Uh, yeah, uh, when I teach actually microbiology, one of the things I say, Antigen is basically if I'm the thief, right, and you need to catch me, which is the virus, well, you can recognize me by my nose, that is specific, by my eyes, that's specific, right, by my ear. Each one of those is an antigen. It's what your immune system can recognize as being different from your own. So basically, the army of the body or the police of your uh, body needs to get that little picture. And the vaccine is just giving them that little picture of piece of the nose so that the police now knows what to fight, what to recognize. It's a simple principle. And we do that even in regular life. The police get the picture maybe of the corner of the, the person. And this is what we need to have. And that is antibodies is what our body develop as what we fight with. A lot of people don't have the knowledge of the wording because they don't have the science behind and knowledge is the key to better understand anything we do in life. So I, I strongly advise people to look up things uh, in the right, the right actually website and the right uh, uh, places to get the right information. So, so continue to uh, continue that analogy. The vaccine is like an all points bulletin the police put out say, have you seen this antigen? If you do, <laughs> get <Right>. them. <laughs> And specifically in the case of the coronavirus vaccines, they are directed against those little red knobby things that are in the picture behind Dr. Kuhl's head. They're on the outside of the virus and they are the molecules that attach the virus to our cells. That is the target for the vaccination strategy is to produce antibodies against those molecules on the surface of the virus. That's it. Uh, in speaking about how uh, pregnant women or women that are nursing have the potential to pass on antibodies to their children or about to be born children, um, are there any known concerns about fertility in people between, you know, of birthing years, let's say 16 to 40, or even later in life, if children were to receive the vaccine in some sense? I think right now um, it's an open question. It will be studied over the period of time and data will be generated and we will understand it more clearly. Uh, so far as right now, we know, uh, know it's a speculation that they, it will, uh, these antibodies, uh, these uh, no, um, antigens or antibodies are not passed uh, except for uh, no, uh, by once the baby is born and it is being uh, through contact or by uh, this uh, lactation. Well, I agree with Dr. Dr. Cole, I, I will say at least so far in the literature I read, there's no evidence to suggest that there should be, you know, um, you know overly large concern. But, uh, you know, uh, this is a novel virus and the response to it is all uh, new. So, you know, there is there is still more information to be gained. Uh, I wanted to highlight that we are getting close to our proposed three o'clock uh, ending time. Uh, one important question I think that should be asked before then is since NGCU is providing the vaccine on site today for those who are willing or would like to get the vaccination, um, Stacy, could you please talk about which vaccines are offered today or if there are multiple or just one? Yeah, uh, so today we do have two vaccines available. Um, we do have some J&J &J on the mobile unit along with Moderna. Um, I had... Um, okay. Yeah, I have requested that because Thanks. what we're seeing let me know who, and she, she'll make the is um, some individuals that are uh, interested in J&J &J that are younger or skew younger. So we wanted to make sure that that was available uh, in addition to Moderna. So Moderna would require a second shot. Um, we would come back for a second visit 
in 28 days from today and or um, at some of our locations where we're offering Moderna in the area, particularly the Bethune Center, which is on MLK, not too far from NJCU and or the Collier Center, which is on Bergen Avenue, also um, not too far from uh, NJCU. So there's opportunities for a second shot right on campus in 28 days or shortly thereafter if someone can't be there. Thank you for the information. Uh, I believe Gloria has a point to add. Yeah, I, you know, because I always have to talk to uh, communities of color because I live, I work, I breathe that. And I know that in communities of color, there will be um, hesitancy. And I know because in their healthcare belief system, there is an underpinning uh, for many of those communities. I saw in your responses, a number of probably nots and definitely nots. And I can almost pinpoint that when they ask people, would they take the vaccine in the pre, uh, in the pre questionnaire? Definitely nots and probably nots. And I see that also in our community surveys here because the statistics will show that people, uh, that there are layers of hesitancy. And some in those layers of hesitancy are I'm certain um, people of color. And, and, and that's a fatalism that runs through the community. Um, if you ask people in my community, uh, if you tell them, um, uh, if you keep smoking, you're gonna die. Uh, and and uh, they'll say, uh, well, okay, uh, why should I stop smoking? Gonna die anyway. And so the fatalism that runs even in this is why should I take this vaccine? What difference is it gonna make? If I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna get it. If I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die anyway. And the reality is, is that, yeah, you're gonna die anyway, but it doesn't have to be of this. And so when we begin to look at what it is that we can do to, to take care of ourselves for a quality of life. I'm saying this to you, yeah, you're gonna die anyway, but it doesn't have to be of this. And so a reality that exists here is for you to get the information that will make you feel comfortable in taking this particular precaution. And so I am encouraging you, I was in that first batch. I was in that first batch because it's a part of our personal responsibility. Find the information that makes you feel comfortable. Contact me personally. I'm in the nursing department here on campus and I can share with you data that might make you feel in a different place about this particular experience. And I encourage you to go today while it's right here, access is a part of it. Go today while it's right here so that you can protect not just you, but grandma, auntie, other mama, and all of those in the community who deserve to be protected. Beautiful, Dr. Bozeman, very good. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, now we're basically at the time, three o'clock, but we have prepared a post survey and we wanna get feedback on how you feel we presented information and if you got what you were expecting and if something, new information's out there and we wanna keep giving new information. Um, so we're gonna put up a slide that will show a, a QR code that will scan on your phone to be able to fill out the survey. We're also gonna provide it in the chat for everybody. And we're also going to stay on for as long as possible afterwards to continue answering questions that have not been answered yet. One moment while we put it all out there. I'd like to take a chance. Uh, by the time you pull up the um, the, uh, the 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 slide, um, to answer a question that that's a recurring question, uh, multiple people um, are asking it uh, again. It's about uh, fertility and the problem when you give you vac you give a vaccine to the children, they might become uh, fertile. Uh, uh, in, uh, they 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 said evidence of fertility problem and uh, affect their future generation. Again. Uh, any medication, any medication that out there in the market, they go through very, very um, uh, strict uh, and uh, testing and uh, 
checking and it's, it's really insane how much they go through. And they try to make sure, and obviously, and we trust because all the medication, even Tylenol, some people will end up having side effect. But a long term, in 20 years, most medication that were out there, they came out without knowing those long term anyway. And um, uh, one of the thing about this particular type of vaccine that is great, again, is the fact that it's degraded right away, right away does not enter your DNA. So there's it's much less likely to give any long-term effect. So to compare this one to a lot of things you've been taking everyday life. I think this one is much safer. And I, 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 I will take my chance 100% because any medication that you have in the market might ultimately in 20 years have something. But these particular ones are well studied and well um, uh, understood compared and much less likely to get those long-term effect. I don't know if anybody else yeah, I would add to that too. And, and a lot of these, what I say, you know, when you're looking at this and saying, well, vaccine this, for, you know, look at the alternative, look at the virus, which represents a much, much bigger unknown um, for all these things, because it hasn't been around long enough to say, you know, um, what are the effects on uh, people who were infected with, with uh, you know, coronavirus when they were a child? And, you know, we, we say there are neurological effects. And to me personally, I have a small child. That is the scariest thing I can think of. And there is no data to say well, what's going to happen to a child who's been infected when they were small and then they grow up because the virus hasn't been around, you know, that long. Vaccines have been around for a long time and similar vaccines to this have been around for uh, quite some time. So, um, you know, I, I would think the virus is, is just, um, you know, to me, potentially scarier than that, just because th there's even more, I think, that we don't know about the virus. But I also want, I'd like to reinforce my, what I said earlier, and that is there's no evidence to suggest that there should be an over, overly sized concern. If there were, we wouldn't be here. Okay. Do we want to attack some more questions? Uh, just in case, I'm just going to remind everyone that the survey is in the chat as well, if you were unable to scan the barcode. Um, I am going to remove the slide visually, but it will still be available in the chat. And then I will present a couple more questions that have yet to be answered, but were pre-submitted. And then we'll go from there. Uh, another question that came up a lot, uh, especially at NJCU, is if professors will also be mandated or held to the same standard that students are supposed to be in terms of having a requirement to either have a vaccination or fill out the proper forms to be exempt? Well, um, I guess as an associate uh, dean and an administrator, I, I may have the, uh, the, uh, the closest information. I don't have uh, any up-to-date information from the last two days. Uh, there is the very strong request that all staff and faculty be uh, be vaccinated. I am not yet aware that there is a requirement, um, but I do understand. I, at least from my understanding, most faculty are already uh, uh, vaccinated because they're concerned. They're concerned themselves, and they're concerned about their families, and and they don't want to come to you know be in a, in a classroom with students and then bring something home to their family. Um, but. To answer your question directly and specifically, uh, I, I'm not aware of a requirement uh, for faculty and staff. I, I believe it's being looked at, um, and, and that's about all I have, unfortunately, at this point. Thank you for speaking on the current uh, guidelines that were provided for us. Um, a lot of people don't have easy access or know how to access the proper information. Is there somewhere we could go to get the proper or the current guidelines provided by the university or a certain directory that we should go towards to find the most up-to-date information? I do know that that information um, has, been, has been distributed and I'm certain it's on the website. Um, I spent a lot of time working on this town hall, so uh, I, I haven't been hunting around a lot the last couple of days, but um, I do know that it's uh, been widely distributed and I have to imagine the search on our university website should turn that up 
It, uh, does anybody had anybody else noticed that information anywhere? The university has a, a COVID information page that is updated fairly frequently. Um, and, you know, this really does speak to the need to, to get qualified, you know, highly qualified information. And in my view, and I understand that a lot of people are reluctant for some reason to trust the CDC, but that is the one source of the the best information that you can get. Um, you know, the CDC and other organiz organizations like it through vaccination, eradicated smallpox from the world, which was a far worse virus than this one in terms of mortality. And it has also largely eradicated polio from the world. And there has not been a case of naturally um, obtained polio in North America for a couple decades now. And so the power of vaccination as a tool for the public benefit is, is proven over and over again. And many of the, many of the fears you know, that are being circulated are not, based in, are not based in real evidence. They're based in, in personal opinion by people who unfortunately, you know, some of us trust politicians and clergymen and business people, professional athletes and the like. And that's really unfortunate um, because vaccination yearly saves probably millions of lives across the planet. And many of the most persistent diseases like malaria, the reason why they still exist is because, and HIV is another example, vaccination strategies are very, very difficult to come about. To come by. Um, so at any rate, um, I always will refer people to the CDC as their as their best source of information. And and um, you know some of the some of the um, some of the objections um, you know people raise. Well, my religion doesn't permit vaccination. There are actually very few explicit prohibitions against vaccination in any organized religion. The vaccines are not produced from any animal tissue. They're 100% synthetic. And if that bothers you, you need to think about all of the other synthetic chemicals that you consume as flavoring agents, coloring agents, and preservatives that are, are in the food that you eat. And never mind all the environmental um, you know, poisons, um, you know, smoke and cigarette smoke and, and, and vehicle smoke and plastics and things like that, that we don't apparently have any discomfort um, living in. However, this one particular thing, um, you know, I understand it's, it's an unnatural or it's a, an artificial, um, it's an artificial substance, but the evidence for its value far, far, far outweighs the evidence against its use. If I could share, uh, first of all, uh, uh, um, uh, Lewis, if anybody does have a question about poli I can, policy, I can certainly uh, provide information. So if somebody wants to email me, my email is smittman at njcu.edu. So apologize for my failure to have uh, some information on the tip of my tongue. But uh, you know, in a conversation that we had in preparation for this uh, town hall, Dr. Gru, Dr. Ben Dowd, and uh, maybe uh, Dr. Bozeman, we had we had mentioned uh, that you know that we that there has to be some faith that medical science uh, can be a benefit. Um, I forgot the exact uh, date, you know years we're talking about, but 100 years ago, the life expectancy of the average person was you know almost half of what it is now. And while there have been bad things that have happened, and maybe some missteps along the way as well. We are all benefits of, of you know, where we stand today with science and medical technology. And that's something that you have to think about. Vaccines play an oversized role in contributing to human longevity. So I just that's an important point to keep in mind. 
I would like to follow up on uh, Dr. Gru. Yeah, I'm sorry, Parisa. Oh, Just a quick follow up on uh, Dr. Gru, which um, excellent point uh, about the polio vaccine and all these vaccines that were that they've been there for a long time, and it's thanks to those vaccines that we were able to eradicate those. But I want to point out that something else that was there for a long time for our students, especially any student here uh, listening to us, uh, I've seen questions where students are asking, "Why am I obligated?" to show proof of that vaccine to come back to campus. Well, just to remind you, every time you sign up or you go uh, apply to a school, you are required to show your vaccination card. Uh, middle school, you're required to go to get your vaccination card. Every single school you've been since you were a baby, technically, I'm just saying, you were required. It's not new. This is something normal. We're trying to protect you, protect your family, protect the faculty. Nothing is new. Why is all of a sudden this COVID vaccine becomes like, oh my God. And it, some people are saying, I've seen question where, oh, the vaccine is gonna enter my, my cell and it's, it's a chip and it's gonna turn. Well, if anything was like this, it would have happened already in the flu vaccine because that's when you get it every year. If they wanted to put something in it, they would have used the flu vaccine. Nobody would question that. Why do we question now the, the COVID? It, it just doesn't make sense. This vaccine is here to, to save our lives, period. And it's just like any other vaccine we've gotten. Okay, it was made much faster, but uh, there's a good reason. And some of you have asked the question, excellent reason. First of all, the knowledge of the mRNA vaccine was known for uh, almost 10 years. So that was easy to put together. Second of all, all the money on earth was put together to make it. and. Pharmaceutical company put the whole package. Of course, in one year, they were able to make it. That would have never happened if it was not all these scientists working together and all of this happening. So it's not because it was done fast that it's not reliable. I just want to say. And, and, and I would add to that, like the, the struggle with trying to keep others safe that don't know, um, you know what they're walking into. And you know, for 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 me as a director of a health department, my job is to try to keep the entire public safe. And vaccines are a historical part of the public's health. While one individual might not agree with it, the global idea of the herd immunity necessary for us to kind of get beyond this, um, you know, terrible crisis is. Uh, there's some things we have to give up that we want to, you know, be a, you know, a better society and a stronger society. So it, it's some of my staff and my own job to try to help people, you know, deal and think through this. And while it's individuals personal decision, your personal decision always impacts others. And, and this is one of those places. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Parisa Asasi for some. Uh, I wanted to add some uh, more. Um, uh, they are really good information, especially Dr. Gro mentioned for source of information. I think the source of information is very important, especially for all of us as an educated pe pe um, pe person. We need to distinguish between reliable source of information and unreliable source of information. So uh, we should ask. What is the evidence behind this statement or behind this? Is it fact or it is just testimony? So that is the area I think we should um, uh, learn. And uh, not only in the COVID-19, in all aspects of the health, because our health is very important. It's a value for us. It's value for our family. So we need to know these information, where are the, uh, they're coming. And CDC, most of the information are evidence-based. So that is a gold standard for information. So that is why for myself, I mean, I, I trust CDC because I know where the information are coming. And in terms of the vaccination, I would say I, I, uh, I experienced the magic of the vaccination in my life. My grandmothers 
um, they had smallpox uh, um, scars on their ha uh, their face, and I have the smallpox of the vaccine uh, scar in my hand. But my kids, even they didn't have smallpox because of the eradication of the smallpox, and mostly is because of the vaccination. And it's the same for polio. And I had some relatives with the polio, but now that we don't see any polio cases. So that is the some history. If we go, we will see how the vaccination can change our life. And trusting the science also is very important. All of these evidence is based on the science. So although uh, the COVID-19 is a new disease, but I think uh, it, um, it shows how the science is important in our life. They made in one year the vaccination. And now in the United States, we see how the vaccination is working. So we are able to go to the um, uh, uh, public places. Uh, and I'm just looking forward to see my students in the classroom and to meet them and to have some conversation face to face in the classroom. So that is the what I can say. And I, I would say, just go to the information, learn, real information, not just trust any of the other information coming from the social media or unreliable sources of information. I agree with what my colleagues have said, but I also want uh, the community and my colleagues to understand, make no mistake, there is inequity in the system. And that make no mistake is that we are disproportionately experiencing the system. And that has resulted in a disparity with regard to the way we arrive to the system as community of colors and the way we are treated in the system as individuals who are uh, uh, community living in communities of color. So yes, I trust the CDC. And yes, I believe the CDC can be trusted, but I also use other organizations who represent community of colors and who also filter that information from me. So I say to other individuals, do that as well. I agree, don't use social media, don't use cousin somebody. You can use other organizations to verify that information for you if it makes you feel more comfortable. I use a variety of sources, you use it too, but you are personally responsible for searching it out and getting rid of the misconceptions and the false information and coming to some conclusion, but base it on something factual and not on the misconceptions that are pervading these issues. We have a personal responsibility for our own health and our decisions. Thank you very much for all of your insight on the importance and other factors we have to consider when getting vaccinated and why it's not just a singular decision and it's multifaceted. And we can't just say, oh, is this a good decision? Yes or no. We have to remember that it's not just about us. It's about our mothers, our grandparents, our siblings, our children. Uh, it doesn't affect just you. It affects everyone you live with. It affects everyone you work with, people you cross on the street randomly, you know. It's I, would add, I would add also, Louis, uh, yesterday I came across in the literature um, the fact that 18 to 50 year olds, 18 to 50 year olds are now the making up the largest proportion of hospitalized COVID patients. This may be, we don't know yet, this may be due to the, to the variants. Uh, it's, it's probably heavily influenced by the fact that Persons over 65 were prioritized for vaccination, but the disease does not discriminate. Certainly not by age. Thank you. Uh, another point that people are bringing up is since we're having two doses of the initial vaccine, are there currently any, is there currently any information that we may need a booster shot? say in one year or two years, or is it too soon to tell? Again, this is under study. Right now, uh, no, as the data comes out, as the people uh, know, uh, there's a continuous monitoring of the people uh, after vaccination. And uh, there's a possibility that there may be a, a needed like flu vaccines every year, or there's a possibility that there may be one, uh, this booster dose needed at the end of the year, or maybe uh, there will be a long-term protection. Uh, in terms of vaccination and medicine in general,
can we ever be 100% certain of anything of? Uh, yes, it is like this, that uh, when the season, seasonal, uh, this uh, pollen and other things come in the atmosphere, some people have allergies, others don't have. It is your genetic makeup, how uh, no uh, whole body, your body reacts. So it would be different for different persons. Like that, for medicines, for uh, vaccines, uh, no, there is a there is a response by your body, by your immune system. So it will vary from person to person. Yeah, I mean, there are so many variables involved. The, the concept of certainty, I mean, I think a lot of people are, are hanging on the word approved. Wait, this isn't an approved vaccine. It's under, you know, an EUA. And you know, the fact of the matter is that there is nothing out there that's 100%. Uh, somebody may, I mean, somebody may have a reaction to something that's been out there for a long, long time. Depends upon environmental factors, your diet, your genetic makeup, any number of different things. The folks shouldn't really get hung up uh, on the on the term approved. That's something that's I think really really very important. Just in case anyone missed it earlier, we did find uh, NGCU's uh, information on COVID nineteen updates in terms of regulation and also any updates in terms of uh, vaccination opportunities. I just put both the links in the chat if you want to look at it on your own time. But to get back to the questioning, uh, we just spoke about how you have to always be cautious about the vaccine. But since this is an mRNA vaccine, uh, and it is slightly, or it's not 100% confirmed to, and nothing's confirmed 100%. Uh, uh, you're, you're talking about the question. There is a question that came up actually um, about the, this is an experimental vaccine and the experimental um, trial is over um, in 2023. Well, that's of course, when you go to the CDC website, there will be scientific explanation, scientific words. And unless you have the knowledge, it's difficult to interpret and understand it. When they use this terminology, the word experimental doesn't mean we don't have the right data about safety. You can keep experimental, experiment on something even though it is safe already. It is safe, it's been tested. Because experimenting means I'm studying, looking at something else. They will still keep looking, for example, to see, do I need a booster? how many people are uh, the 95 versus 96 and um, is it effective, not effective on children? This is what we mean by experimental. When they say it's still experimental, it doesn't mean we don't know um, its effectiveness and that is done, that particular part is done for now. Uh, so when they keep experimenting, it, this is just keep studying in the long term and that's part of many medication that came out. So. Uh, it, it's, it's interesting how uh, you feel afraid about and fear very often come from not knowing something. It's like you enter a room and it's dark. Well, I'm afraid of the dark because I don't know what's there. But if I look up the information, well, I will be comforted to better understand. And unfortunately, yes, there is scientific terminology. There is scientific um, processes that are difficult for the population to understand. But when you say, when you come to a school like us and we are here for you, we are teaching, we are here to give you the knowledge. We are open to explain anything you would want. And trust us, if it wasn't because we feel that it is safe for all of us and better for everyone as a community, we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't be asking you to please try to get your vaccine. So that's very important to understand. It's because we care. We care about you. And when I, you come to this university, you all know that this university is all about community. We care about our community. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. I, I think you know probably something related that maybe is worthwhile mentioning. I've seen a number of the questions on the list. And I've heard it many times just in conversation with family 
is the idea is this is new technology. This is, are they testing this on me? And this is experimental. And, you know, uh, I, I think it's very important to clarify that the, this mRNA, you know, vaccine technology, it's not new. It is not new. I, I, I feel bad that your know, public media, TV, the news shows, even newspapers, they say this. I'm just, it's unfortunately, it's, it's just not true. Let me share my screen. Um, and, uh, okay. okay. Can everybody see that? So why is that not coming up? Can everybody see that the mRNA is not new for whatever reason? Ah, uh, there we go. Um, so, you know, I put this together because I'd seen this question so many times. So here's an example of a number of the uh, you know, front page of articles. Uh, one's going back here to, you can't see it very well, direct gene transfer into mouse muscle in vivo. That's going back to 1991. But that doesn't go even back far enough. The fact is that, you know, mRNA was really a discovered in 1961. In the 1970s, that's really when this whole technology was gestated. And 1990 was the first time that they started injecting mRNA. These were when the studies first started. And it's a notable year. The most notable one here is 2011. Already looking at um, anti-cancer uh, therapies using mRNA technology. This is not new stuff. Uh, they've already been lo looking at uh, mRNA technology for flus. They were working on this. That's why they were able to develop this so quickly. They weren't creating anything new. They were using technology that had already been established and simply applied it to a new genetic sequence that we got from the coronavirus. Really that simple. So this is not new. And uh, people are sort of misguided or misled by the experimental term and the jargon that we use in science. Sometimes... You know, that information doesn't transfer over very well. Let me uh, stop screen share and Louis, we can go to the next question, I guess. Uh, in terms of uh, the university mandating the vaccine, is this unique to just New Jersey City University, or is this becoming more of a commonplace and likely most colleges will make the same requirement? Uh, I, I can take a crack at that. I mean, I, I think you know, legally they've pointed out that, you know, businesses and corporations are fully within their rights to um, uh, require uh, vaccinations. Uh, while I don't necessarily agree with that, but the, the point here is that it really does look like, I mean, one after another, if we look in the Chronicle, we look in all the journals that are relevant to uh, institutions of higher education, uh, this is becoming more the norm than otherwise. And it's really about that we're spending a lot of time in the same room and, you know, you're hoping that the, you know, there's good ventilation and everybody's wearing masks, but you know, even with the vaccine, right, you can still breathe a viral particle up your nose. And if you don't know someone in that room has been vaccinated or not, and they're, remember, the vaccine is not just about the individual. It's about, it's a societal issue. It's about what you bring home to your family and your friends. And so I, if I, if I were a guessing or a betting man, um, I'd say that there's going to be a lot more universities coming online making the same requirement. Look, Rutgers is the first institution in the nation to do it. And a, a lot have been falling in the same line. And again, this is no different, right? You know, MMR, mumps, rubella, uh, mumps, uh, 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 measles, rubella, whooping cough, tetanus. It, this is, it's the same. It's exactly the same. And by the way, I see one of the questions is how will that be checked uh, in school here that someone's been vaccinated? That's going to happen in exactly the same way that it's done now for say the measles vaccine. So um, in case anybody's curious, that's the way that they will uh, verify in the same way you do with the other, other immunizations. Uh, there's also some questioning along the lines of how vulnerable are children to getting COVID-19, 
if people are getting vaccinated for the traditional strain, or is there a likelihood that the virus will adapt to infect specifically children versus the general population? Oh, I, I, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, I'm piggybacking off what uh, Dr. Bendow had said, and she was entirely right. Viruses mutate. It's what they do. And, and the longer this is out there, that's why to me, it's, it's, it's a little worrisome what's going on in South America and in India. Um, it's like a Petri dish. You know, the more cases of the disease out there, things happen. And they find you know efficient ways to better infect uh, other individuals, or maybe you know perhaps become more lethal. Uh, maybe you know find a preference for um, younger individuals. Um, this is certainly uh, some concern I have, and to me is all the more reason why we have to try and you know at least try to march to herd immunity. You know, that's, that's absolutely true. There are many diseases that we are immunized for now as children that used to kill thousands of American children every year. Diphtheria and pertussis are things that we really don't experience in any numbers anymore. And that's because we immunize against them. Those diseases, the, the pathogens are still present, but they can't harm immunized individuals, and they also don't harm adults because the immunity for many of those wears off over time. But the, um, in the case of, of those, uh, I think about the bacterial diseases and a mature immune system is, is, is capable of overcoming them and adults are, 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 are invulnerable to them. Now, there have been instances where People have figured, well, these things don't happen anymore. I'm not going to bother to have my child immunized. And guess what? Cases started to pop up again because the pathogen didn't go away. Now, specifically with, with COVID, a mature immune response, a mature individual has a different immune system than a child. And it's thought <clears throat> that number one, that difference is one of the main reasons why yeah, children are, are tending not to succumb and to experience the disease significantly the way older individuals are. And older individuals are much more susceptible to severe COVID disease because of the difference that they, the difference between their immune system and that of a child. This is also the basis for prioritizing older Americans for vaccination over younger Americans. So children seem to be better capable, better equipped, even though their immune systems aren't mature, they seem to be better equipped to prevent COVID from causing disease. So um, that of course is you know, a, valid, a valid point, you know, how can I protect my child? Uh, but it, it, from what we know right now, it seems that they're pretty well defended on their own. Well, in, in addition to that, um, Dr. Gro, uh, the FDA is ready to approve uh, Pfizer for 12 to 16 right. year olds. And, and we're ready, uh, you know, we're ready to get all those 16 to um, 12 to 16 year olds, uh, you know, vaccinated as soon as their families are ready to vaccinate them. And I think the way the, the process has been is like, with everything, adults are able to make their own decisions, so they've made their own decision. And then the buy-in and them feeling good or going through that process to now continue to move the, the research model to younger and younger sections of the, the population. Uh, and those are populations that actually interact more with each other. So 12 to 16 year olds, uh, you know, we're focused on those that are playing uh, sports, right? That's where we're seeing the uptick in the youth is particularly in group sports. So. That's all very valid information, but we also have another question asking on mRNA vaccines again. And why was the COVID vaccine developed with mRNA technology specifically 
versus using the more common methods that most vaccines use. It's actually very, uh, it's much faster to make. And um, the, the, it was developed actually, that, that was the easy, that's why the first two were actually mRNA because it's easy to synthesize compared to the other one. It's it just a pharmacology principle. Uh, to make it, it was easier. And uh, uh, again, the science behind it, the use of RNA um, in therapy has been, I started more than 10 years ago. So that's not, it's not uh, something we don't know, but it was really the best, uh, the, the best one, uh, the, the quickest one to actually get uh, going. To add uh, to Dr. Bendol's point, the <coughs> technology, number one, uh, the synthesis of the antigen for this is very fast through mRNA and the production level uh, by traditional ways, there's a lot, uh, no, it takes a lot of uh, raw material, a lot of uh, resources to produce a uh, lot of vaccine. And uh, no, the production level is not up to that mark as compared to the mRNA technology. You have to just take a small bit of RNA, clone it, you know, through the techno clone it, and then you can produce it in a bulk. So you are producing a lot of vaccine, and it serves the uh, whole you know, countries together, while as the other one takes a lot of time. This follow-up question may be slightly off-topic, but if it's if mRNA has been so effective for COVID-19 specifically, is there a likelihood we may transition other vaccines towards an mRNA structure? Yes, yes, yes. New future generation vaccines will definitely, you know, uh, this has changed the course and there will be more and more uh, applications of this technology. This is a blessing in disguise, you can say. Uh, that concludes most of the questions we have in regards to the actual virus itself that were pre-submitted. Um, we do have a collection of questions on the process of attempting to get exempt for the university, but it's my knowledge that in the links before, you'll be able to get the paperwork that you may need, even though you know weighing the benefits of getting the vaccination may be in your best interest and especially in the best interest of the people around you. If I recall in Stacy's opening slide, she showed us specific demographic information about Jersey City. And one of those metrics that really stood out to me was that about 30% of new cases within the past month were contracted from people 16 to 30 years old. But if we take a look at the serious reactions to COVID, it's people that are 60 and over. So we have to remember that it's not just a personal decision. It's everyone around you. It's your family, your parents, your grandparents, your aunts and uncles. Um, even if you yourself may not get that severely affected, if the numbers say that you're less likely to have a severe reaction versus somebody else, you still have to remember that there are lots of somebody else's in your life. Um, there's also been some questioning about possible long-term effects. And I know that the vaccine has been out for a relatively short amount of time. Do we have any information of some potential long-term side effects that could resolve from catching COVID-19? I can take this question. I was going to say, I'd let the epi help. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, I would say since that uh, COVID is a new disease, um, in the beginning, we started to see who is getting disease, who, who is most affected, what is the rate, what is the transmission mode. So we were learning this um, uh, part. And uh, now we know more information regarding this, um, uh, uh, how it's transmitting who is getting more disease, but now most of the uh, researchers or research or, or studies are um, focusing on the uh, long effect of the COVID-19. So we don't know exactly what would be the long effect, but we see many patients with the different um, uh, um, effects, uh, such as um, some 
uh, heart problem or um, even the, uh, some um, the problem in the um, uh, mouth or teeth. So we see many of the problem, but uh, we are in the, um, the process of learning and studying. So now most of the uh, research, uh, research are focusing on the how would be the long effect of the COVID-19. So that would be area we are learning and hopefully we will, um, uh, we will be able to prevent the long effect of the COVID-19 soon with the right uh, public health measures, including vaccine. Thank you. I also wanted to add, I'm recalling some research I've done personally last year um, for a COVID-19 panel, and I stumbled upon some disheartening information that the mortality rate of COVID-19 is a lot higher than people think it is. I know that when I last saw the data, and this was maybe five months ago, so the numbers may have changed slightly, uh, for people aged 50 or 50 to 55, there was a, about a 10% mortality rate. And that's one in 10 grandparents. And for every five years you added on, there was an additional two to 3% added to that initial 10%. So if you go to an 80 year old grandparent, the percentage could be as high as 30% fatality, regardless of other comorbidities, regardless of other things that that person may be dealing with that COVID-19 may exacerbate existing conditions. Uh, and it does dampen the body's ability to respond to things it's already dealing with. And I, I would add to that too, there's also some, um, there's indirect effects of this too, that there are some people who have other serious illnesses such as cancer and such that um, their treatment has not been what it normally would have been because the health system is just completely overwhelmed. Um, and I can say specifically, actually, my uh, my grandmother was one of these and she passed away recently from cancer. Um, she was in pretty bad shape, but like literally being kicked out of the hospital twice when she was, you know, on dialysis, bleeding and such that, you know, under normal circumstance, I mean, her physician was, was shocked that this, that they would have kept her in there. But, you know, when the hospital's overwhelmed dealing with this crisis, um, it's going to affect, you know, their ability to care for other diseases too. Not only the ability to care for other diseases, we were called into a meeting not too long ago about screenings and how they had dropped significantly. Mammogram screening, pelvic, uh, pap smears, colonoscopies all fell off tremendously in the year. So in falling off in that year, we know how far things can advance in that year and that you know people are still not coming in for what would have been routine screenings in that year so we're getting a lot of like you you're just mentioning a lot of the residuals and the other impacts uh we're not even beginning uh we're beginning to talk about what the behavioral health issues will be um with relationship to people being isolated for so long and another hesitancy of people returning back to their normal experiences. We, we, this, this pandemic is so impactful that we can't even wrap our heads around all of the things that are going to come out of it. And on a one positive note, there was a question uh, that were asked about, um, so how can I get ready for the vaccine to try to avoid having, you know, a uh, bad side effect. Is there anything I can eat? Is there anything I can do to prepare? And I'm gonna say, honestly, this is the, the best question ever because it tells me you're willing to go for it. And this is, this, is, this is how we go for war. We know there is a war, right? We know there might be casualty. We know it's, it might be hard. We know there is risk in everything. But the idea is let me go for it, but let me prepare for it. So yes, you go for it, what is the vaccine? It's simply giving a little, you know, a little piece uh, that resembles the virus so that your immune system will react and the whole work is gonna be your immune system. So what you need to do is just making sure your immune system is ready to go. So you know what, eating well, being healthy, um, good nutrition, um, good workout, even vitamins, anything, it's the same as when you get the, the, the COVID, what they were telling you, because the only thing is 
make sure that your immune system is strong. And this is a, this is a lesson for life because today is COVID, tomorrow is gonna to be something else unless we start taking the right precaution. So make sure that at this point, it's trying to find the solution, not keeping bugging on the problems because problems, they will always be there. What are the solution? We know what are the solution. Get the vaccine, keep the distance until we can get this enough people. So to stop the virus from moving from one to another, that's all we want, stopping it. And it won't go anywhere. It's like, you know, you close, you have a mosquito coming to the room, you just close the room, keep it there until it dies, we're good. <laughs> and for a lot of people, um, they don't even, you know, have any after effects. So my family, it's been about 50, 50. And so I was bracing myself. I was like, okay, I'll get this on a Friday. So Saturday, cause you know, my sister, it's just for one day, she was tired, had a bit of a fever, but it's like, okay, I, I don't want to plan on doing something intense if I'm tired. And I had nothing. And then, you know, I think like you had mentioned earlier, I got worried. I was like, well, does that mean I didn't get an immune response? But when you look it up, it's, it doesn't correlate, you know, to that. It's just random, you know, like, you know, do prepare, you may be a little tired the next day, but but really that, that, that's kind of it. You might, you might not have anything from it. I, I had a little bit of a sore arm, but that, that was it. So another another uh, you know, piece of information, the latest uh, piece of literature I read about this, 60% of people have no side effects. Right? I wasn't one of those, unfortunately, but uh, you know, had a little headache. But so most people more often than not, you probably won't have side effects. I didn't have anything. I felt better. <laughs> and stronger right yes, and psychologically less, less stress definitely yes psychologically oh my god when i got the second shot to be honest i was about it was the competition at home because it was who got it first and i kept trying to work to get my my uh, my uh, appointment my husband got it first i was so upset stacy i wish i knew you so i would have gotten my vaccine earlier I got it after him. <laughs> In fact, if you that, that, that was the hardest thing. I my, not even my parents could have. You know, I was like, it was very much. This is the rule. Um, yeah. And and you know, it's so hard when in the very beginning we only got three hundred vaccines one week or five hundred the next week. We really needed to follow the protocols. So in fact, if you have the side effects, that may be actually telling that your immune system is good. It is reacting. You may be you know, uh, healthy. I, I might want to add some points. If um, you have vaccine, my advice is as Maryam, Dr. Maryam mentioned, take a good uh, um, uh, Good nutrition um, uh, with high protein, good vitamins, and also sleeping. It's uh, uh, when you have a good quality of sleep, it helps your immune system be active to make more antibodies. Now, it's, I mean, my daughter just got her first, second dose yesterday. I'm just texting her, just make sure you are taking rest and your body is strong to make more um, uh, antibodies. So that is the part of the vaccine. And I think I would not say side effect is a part of the reaction our body makes. So that is not scary. Well, I guess as the, as the host of this event, I think it's about time that we, uh, we wrap this up. I wanted to thank all the attendees for joining us. The fact that you came on means that you, you wanted more information and you wanted to learn more. And that's, that's all that anybody can ask. And uh, I, I hope that we've helped you in you know, being able to make a decision or at least maybe help you along whatever path you wanna take. And um, just keep in mind that you know, we're trying to you know, present the idea that it's not just about you as an individual, but it's about everybody. Um, I want to thank all the panelists again. You guys were really wonderful. Um, we've met many times in preparation for this and you, uh, I, I, I couldn't have worked with a better group of folks, real professionals and experts. I'm really, really, uh, I've been excited to work with uh, such talent here and uh, um, you know, maybe we'll get to uh, do something else sometime <laughs> after the pandemic. 
<laughs> you can invite us again, no problem. <laughs> All right, um, uh, and uh, uh, Louis, I, you know, I, I didn't thank you, um, uh, our student moderator. I wish you a happy graduation. I look forward to uh, seeing you in June, uh, in person, and we can bang elbows, I guess. And uh, um, why, if, if you're an example of what's graduating from NJCU, um, there are great things ahead of us. You're, you're a, a, a <laughs> Gee, a model, a model student, and uh, I don't know what we would have done without you. You've been well, endlessly helpful. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. It was definitely much easier than you make it sound with such a talented collection of panelists. Uh, I also just want to remind everyone again that if you have not filled out the post survey, it's shared right now in the screen, and I will attempt to find the link to put it again in the chat box. And we'll try to leave it up for another two minutes to make sure everyone was able to fill it out. But I definitely want to thank you, Scott, for allowing me to present here, uh, Dr. Aaron O'Neill for recommending me to you and all these wonderful panelists that I've worked with before. And now that I've worked with the rest of them today, I look forward to working again if we have the opportunity. And the two postscripts for me, one, the vaccination pop-up clinic, it's still happening. It's right out there in front of the public, uh, the professional studies building uh, off of uh, auto, the Autobahn uh, Street entrance. And number two, if you enjoyed, or, or I don't know, enjoyed, but if you learned something in this town hall, uh, we have recorded it. And uh, I understand it will be posted on the NJC website, so you can refer to it later or, you know, share with others and, you know, maybe they can, uh, you know, take part of, in the uh, town hall after the fact. Uh, but uh, thank everybody out there and I wish everybody good health and well and, uh, you know, go home and let's enjoy our families. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Pleasure. Bye.